The following is a presentation of the Eagles Sports Network. Let's go, kids. Welcome into episode five of Mossy Creek Conversations. I'm Michael Watrank. Thanks for tuning in to this episode. Our guest today, let's get the, the full one out of the way. He's a four-time North Carolina Sportscaster of the Year. He's been in the industry for four decades. He spent 12 seasons at Carson Newman. He is Stan Cotton. Stan, thanks for taking some time. Looking forward to reminiscing a little bit about your Carson Newman days. Yeah, going to be fun. Looking forward to it. Appreciate the uh, the invite. Well, normally in these, when, when you read the bio, you think maybe we're going to hop into some, you know, Carson Newman football stuff, or we're going to hop into, you know, Wake Forest stuff. I want to start back in your high school days, because there are very few people that can potentially have this conversation of knowing Ken Sparks, the high school football coach. What was it like playing for him? Oh, wow. Uh, it, it's, it's funny. I, when, when Ken came to Farragut High School, he literally turned that campus upside down, not just the football program, which he, I think the year before he got there, we were four and seven, something like that. And uh, he just completely flopped it around and, and we started winning games. But uh, uh, he, as, as, as you know, very committed to his faith. Uh, our Fellowship of Christian Athletes chapter there really started bolstering and got larger. And uh, so just in so many ways, he was involved in the community, he and his family, uh, he just turned everything up on its ear. And for whatever reason, uh, and I'm not exactly sure, Michael, what the reasons were, but he and I bonded quickly. I, I think probably it was because, number one, I was his quarterback, and I think rightfully so and understandably so over the years, uh, all the way through his tenure at Carson Newman, he had a special relationship with uh, with his quarterbacks. But, but, but he and I connected on another level, on a spiritual level, on a personal level, uh, and so for there, for just a short while, he, he was my football coach. And then uh, he was certainly more like a second father to me as well. Uh, and then he became a friend and, and we just stayed so close over the years until the day he died. Uh, he stood up with me at my wedding. Uh, and once I got to, to Marshall and, and, and to, into Wake Forest, I typically would come back home to Knoxville. My parents are still there, still living and still there. I would come back a couple times a year, once at Christmas and once in the summer, at least, if not more. But but those two times for sure. And uh, if not both times, at least one of those times, I would always make plans to stop in Jefferson City. And, and a lot of times Ken and I would meet at his house. We would meet at a restaurant, wherever, uh, and just catch up, just love on one another. Uh, but he, uh, you know, he was... Uh, he was just a force. Uh, and when he got to, to Farragut High School back in the 1970s, he was a force that we all welcomed with open arms and uh, just injected uh, incredible amount of, of energy. And uh, he, he, there was just something about him that, that uh, you know, people gravitated uh, toward him. And certainly I did. And, and I latched on to him and, and held on for, for decades and decades. But uh uh, think about him still to this day so often. Uh, I, I would venture a guess every few days. Uh, just think about the, the times we had together and the special times uh, at Farragut, but mostly the special times at Carson Newman once we got there together and, and got paired up and and uh, was along for the ride of, uh, of a lifetime with those national titles that he brought to Mossy Creek. So uh, anyway, I just uh, – there have been uh, – a, a lot of special people in my life, but he's right up there in the top uh, handful for sure. Uh, he was something uh, unique and special. Love him dearly. And uh, he's he's the reason I'm doing what I'm doing right now, quite honestly. He, uh, uh, you know, proved to me that he was more than, than just my football coach. He was concerned about me and, and concerned, uh, especially when my football career ended and the way that it did end, he was concerned about me. Oh, what are you going to do now? So, uh, along with some nudging from him and others, I got into media and broadcasting and still doing it. So anyway, uh, I, I could go the, the whole time on, on Ken Sparks, but uh, he was he was something. Yeah, I want to talk about that because uh, 
I listen to the Say the Damn Score, Score podcast for those out there that, that aren't broadcasters. That is a, a podcast that's run by Logan Anderson that talks to a lot of broadcasters about their path. And and you mentioned in that that uh, you were getting recruited to potentially play uh, college football, but you had a, a couple couple injuries that, that set that back. And here you are, a student at the University of Tennessee, and Coach Sparks takes over at Carson Newman, and he calls you to broadcast. So... A lot of people will say they owe a lot to Coach Sparks. Well, you, in essence, owe your career to Coach Sparks because he gave you that first opportunity. What do you remember about that phone call and then uh, as you got prepared for those first opportunities? You know, it really, Michael, wasn't really a phone call. You know, we just we were involved in each other's lives. And, and uh, you know, I, I wanted to play football. That was that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to play football as long as I could. And I shared that dream with a Farragut teammate of mine who went on and, and played 15 years for the Dallas Cowboys. So, you know, it was a we felt uh, and for for Bill Bates, it certainly was a realistic uh, goal of playing football for a long time. We were both pretty heavily recruited, as a lot of other guys were at Farragut at the time. And, uh, you know, a couple of knee injuries uh, uh, cut that dream short and uh, started, you know, just went to school at Tennessee and and, and uh, was in communications and at working uh, at WIVK Radio with current Voice of the Vols, Bob Kessling, who I owe so much more to as well with regard to my broadcasting career. But it was really Coach Sparks who who nudged me in, in that direction uh, and just had so much confidence in me, even though I'd never been behind a microphone in my life. Uh, but he just thought, you know, this is something you could probably do in a way at least for you to stay connected uh, with football and basketball and baseball and just sports in general. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we had these conversations of once he went to Carson Newman from Farragut, about maybe helping out with a broadcast there. And Bill Powell, a local businessman, was was doing the play-by-play. And uh, Greg Parham, who went on to be an official in the ACC, uh, was also part of those broadcasts. And and Coach Sparks kind of helped uh, graft me into that crew. And and I owe so much to Bill Powell just in, you know, he, he saw a young guy that wanted to do it for a living and he was doing it kind of as a hobby. He was the president of First People's Bank there in Jefferson City at the time and a Carson Newman grad and just loved the Eagles. And, uh, and so we did one year together and then he graciously stepped away from the microphone to get this snotty nosed kid a chance to, to do it. And uh, so with that combination of, of Coach Sparks and Bill Powell and others uh, there in Jefferson City, just kind of opened the door for me to, to start. Uh, and it was 41 years ago. That was 1980 when all that started to, to happen. And and uh, here we are in 2020, and I'm still going along. This is season 41 for me, doing college football and, and, and basketball coming up, hopefully after this, if we survive the pandemic. But uh, – yeah, a lot of memories uh, down those roads with regard to Coach Sparks and getting started. And, you know, the, the, the play-by-play thing caught me right away after I did that first game. It was, this is it. This is what I want to do because it was a way for me to stay so closely connected to the games. You know, it. Uh, I did some television in Knoxville, as you know, and, and loved my time at, at WIVK, but I wanted to be a part of the games. That, to me, was was what I thought would be most meaningful uh, and a way for me to really stay plugged into sports. And that, that really, to, to me, was, was true and, and is what I still love about it to this day because, you know, once you hook up and the game start, you don't know what's going to happen. You're part of the game, and you have to react in, in real time to what's going on in the field. And so it's as close to playing as anything I've ever come across and, and why I still love it and why I will still do it as long as they'll let me here, here at Wake Forest. Do you remember what your first game was, who the opponent was, what the score might have been? I, I, I remember it being a big wake win. It might have been Clark College out of Atlanta, uh, but I'm not positive on that. Um, so, so no, and it's, it's funny. I, I've talked to people over the years, and as the years continue to, to, to tick by, those types of memories to me start to fa- start to fade a little bit uh, into the fabric and you remember people, you know, you remember uh, the relationships and things like that. But it, it 
you have to go look that up. Maybe I can look it up. It might have been Clark College out of Atlanta, but I, I'm not completely positive. So if if you called the first game of the season, and I'm going to assume that you did in 1980, it was a Carson Newman win, 30 to 21 over Central Florida, and that team went seven and three that season. That was with Bill Powell still doing, okay. uh, you know, the play by play Central Florida. Because I remember that was down in Orlando, mm-hmm. uh, if if I recall correctly. But uh, I think the first one I did on my own might have been Clark in 81. Okay. But, um, uh, yeah, that that uh, that to us, you know, playing at Central Florida, I think we played in the old Tangerine Bowl. Uh, the, the setting was was much, quote unquote, bigger time than we were used to in terms of uh, seats in the stadium and all those types of things. So I remember that game uh, working that with Bill very, very vividly and and uh, just uh, you know, excited beyond belief to, to be a part of that for sure. During your 12 years, Carson Newman football won five national championships during that time. Um, does one in particular stick out to you? Absolutely. 1983 uh, in Colorado in Grand Junction against Mesa College. I think may, maybe Mesa State now, but uh, I think it was just Mesa College back then. Uh, you know, Wake Forest, uh, rather uh, Carson Newman won. I'll probably make that mistake more than once in these uh, in, in these moments with you. But uh, it was, uh, I think at the time, uh, Carson Newman was the lowest ranked team to make the playoffs, the first ever team to win a national title on the road. Uh, and, and just, you know, that was just Ken Sparks. You know, he just, uh, I think all of us, once those playoffs started, uh, in 83 felt that, you know, we're going to get this done and uh, just uh, remember it. I remember they had to kind of chop up the field before game time, bring in a helicopter and blow all the ice chunks away. It's a cold, frigid day there in Grand Junction, which is on the western slope of the Rockies. Uh, and just, I don't know, there was something about that day. Uh, I, I just never doubted that, that Carson Newman was going to win that game. And uh, won that first national title, the, the first of those you mentioned. And uh, for sure, that one sticks out more than the others to me, at least, because it was the first and it was special. Uh, and I think all of us uh, involved in the program back in those days felt that it would happen eventually. Uh, but to happen for Coach Sparks in his fourth season, uh, not sure if we felt it would happen that early, but uh, I think once it started, once the playoffs started in, in 83, I think a lot of us felt that, you know what, th- this team's good enough to win it. Carson Newman entered as uh, the number 12 team in the country, won that game 36 to 28 back in 1983, the first of five national titles. Uh, what do you what sticks out about some of those national championship teams, players, moments, memories? As you mentioned, it might not necessarily be the uh, the 1917 kind of victory in week four, but it might be one of those people that, that you got to spend a lot of time with. Well, I just. <laughs> Carson Newman was so well coached. I mean, you could just see it. And and regardless of the circumstances uh, of, of the games, uh, ahead, behind, whatever, I think there was such a, a, a calm approach to it. And, and I think that filtered down from Coach Sparks to Coach Turner to Coach Deaton, all the others, all the way down uh, to the players. And, you know, there was never any kind of sense of, of – of panic or on, on the flip side, we, we've got this in the bag. I think there was just a, a cool headedness about it that, that you could sense from the very top. And you have to give the credit uh, for that to Ken. Uh, uh, but that's our, what I remember about mostly every one of those championship games, you know, this is, you know, you, you can imagine, or you could certainly understand there being a lot of nerves on the part of the players, things like that. Playing for a national championship, I mean, you're down to the final two in the country. But don't ever remember being uh, or seeing the, our teams, the Carson Newman teams of those days, uptight. Uh, they just enjoyed being in the moment uh, and were able to perform at their best in the moment. Um, and I, I just think you have to give so much credit to Coach Sparks and the rest of the staff for that. And, and that, to me, really is what stood out about about that. And, and then once you win one, you know, you become kind of the hunted and, and back in, in those days, without question, Carson Newman was the program of, of, of that division and of that time, you know, it was when we all got there uh, together kind of in 1980, 
uh, Elon was the team that was winning national titles. And then Carson Newman kind of wrested that away from Elon and hung on to it for, for such a long time. It's very, very impressive. When you look at uh, the 1980s in terms of football, uh, that was the NAIA days. And from what I've heard from people, and you know, this might be a little bit biased, is that a lot of those teams could compete with much higher level teams. What do you remember about the talent now that you've gone through, uh, t- as you mentioned, 25 years of ACC football? H- how do you remember the talent on the field in terms of football players? Yeah, it, it was scary good uh, at, at, at times, especially across that first level. You know, what gets teams like Carson Newman in, in trouble or or now FCS teams in trouble when they play up and play higher divisions is depth. Um, and that back in the day had had Carson Newman played up, um, that would have probably gotten gotten the Eagles too. But Across the front line now, I, I just they really had some some very talented players. And I think the scheme really uh, was tough. We used especially offensively that split back veer uh, in high school that folks couldn't figure out. They just could not find a, a really good, consistent way to to stop it. And I think uh, that's what Carson Newman was facing a lot back in those days was defenses that just couldn't get them fig- figured out. Um, you may stop them here, you may stop them there, but eventually uh, that thing's going to break through. And, and uh, you know, if, if you just offensively, if you uh, were able to execute properly, you were going to have the advantage more times than not. And I think that's really uh, another thing that stood out to me, that scheme that people just couldn't couldn't figure out. I mean, the tackles were splitting out like wide receivers just about, and, and you could see defenses just like, what do we do? How do we handle this? And uh, you know, the fact that, that, that Carson Newman was able to continue to, to do that, and, and I'm not sure if there were a whole lot of modifications even uh, when, when Ken stepped down and Coach Turner took over. Of course, Coach, Coach Turner was the offensive coordinator for a number of those years and certainly the offensive line coach uh, in the early days. But uh, I just don't think folks figured it out all that well, even, uh, even to current day. You know, I'm not exactly sure what – uh, what the Eagles ran last fall, but uh, uh, you know, I, I credit the scheme, and then it always falls back to Coach Sparks, right, of, of putting that in there and, and hanging with it. And I'm sure there were a few modifications, but not that many. There definitely haven't been. It's it's been the same kind of bread and butter type of stuff. Uh, you mentioned your relationship with Coach Sparks. You mentioned the fact that that he was in your wedding. Uh, I want one story. Give me one good story that you remember about him. It could be from your high school playing days. It could be from the time that you guys were shooting the Ken Sparks show. It could be from, uh, you know, even the last couple decades or something. What's one story that really sticks out to you that talks about Coach Sparks? Wow. Um, you're asking me to pick from uh, from decades, but I remember <laughs> once in, in high school, uh, rival at the time was Oak Ridge. And Oak Ridge had a great, great program. And uh, the, the game was at Farragut, and this was prior to uh, the new high school. This was even at the old uh, high school, or at least at the old high school field. The, the new school might have been open, but we were still playing at the time at, at the old field. But um, And the head coach uh, at Oak Ridge uh, in pregame warm-ups was kind of walking through the Farragut side of the field, just kind of looking at the players. And he was kind of a, an eccentric character, if I recall, um, uh, but a, just an incredible football coach. Uh, uh, and some gamesmanship, I think, uh, uh, with that. And I'm not sure Ken really I, – I, I know that Ken didn't take to that all, all too kindly, but uh, didn't really do anything uh, uh, there. But once the game was over, I think he contacted the coach and, and said – you know, you and I need to meet, and we're, we're going to meet at the Clinton High School football field, uh, which they did on one afternoon the next week or a couple of weeks after that and and uh, uh, had a conversation about that. And, and to me, um, you know, that, that really had nothing to do with me, but, but it, it, it showed me a lot about Ken Sparks that he um, – first of all, cared about his players deeply and his program deeply. That was, I mean, that was understood. But uh, he also cared about that other coach, and he did not want to 
uh, shame him publicly. He didn't want to make a scene there at the at the high school football game. They they found neutral ground uh, after the game was over uh, and several days later, so that both maybe Coach Sparks' um, uh, anger could have cooled a bit and and maybe. Uh, Oak Ridge's football coach's head could have cleared a little bit anyway. And the two came together and uh, made up and, and, and I think had, had a very good relationship from that point going forward. But, but it showed me a lot uh, about Ken uh, too, in that, you know, he, he didn't do things like most people did, you know, uh, uh, and, and we laughed a number of times about that story. You know, coach Sparks uh, even told me, he said, I'm not sure if we were going to get in a fight, you know, right there in the middle of the Clinton high school football field or what, but, uh, they didn't. And, and I don't think, uh, Ken ever, uh, had, uh, intended that they would, he just wanted to have a, uh, a, a very frank conversation, um, and which apparently they had, I wasn't there. I'll just take coach Parks' word for it. But, uh, and again, I, I think that the, the big takeaway from that is, uh, they had a great relationship from that point on. So to me, that's just coach Sparks, a uh, very unique individual had a different take on, on things. And, and that's the way he handled a, a situation he, he thought should not have happened, uh, with, with one of his teams. But, you know, personally, I, you know, coach Sparks loved food. And usually when he and I met, it was a lot of times at his house around uh, cheeseburgers and chili or, or chicken wings or something like that. Or he loved Mexican food. I remember once he uh, I lived in Dallas for a year um, right before I, I got the television job in, in Knoxville at Channel 26 slash Channel 8. And Ken came out to, to Dallas uh, to speak at a national conference or something. And uh, I took him to a, a, a place uh uh, on the outside outskirts of town there in Dallas that, that we had found and, but he loved to eat. And so, uh, I, I'll never forget that about him. We, we had so many meetings over meals and, and the meals were, uh, generally the, uh, the central part of those get togethers. Uh, so that, that, that's always fun remembering how well, uh, coach liked to eat. Yeah, after a lot of the games here, uh, he'd come up to the press box and it'd be more of a conversation. Of, hey, what, what's on that plate over there? What, what, what do you got over there? It, 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 the football game kind of kind of ran secondary yeah. at that point. So, Not surprising at all. Not at all. Um, so we've talked a lot about the football and, 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 and that stuff, but you, you had other duties while you were at Carson Newman. Uh, what do you remember about um, being involved outside of football and, and doing some of the other things uh, at, at Carson Newman during your time? It's interesting. I was a full-time employee at Carson Newman on two different occasions. One um, was kind of a, a half public relations job with the, with the college at the time, university now, but college at the time. And the other half was athletics. Uh, mostly what I did was in athletics. Um, we were trying to, to kind of create some things in the public relations office, and, and we did uh, do that. And then a second stint a few years later, after I'd returned from Dallas and was back in Knoxville working in television, calling the Carson Newman games. And I remember uh, the first week or so on set there at Channel 26 at the time, later to become Channel 8. And, and first of all, loved my time there, but knew it's not what I wanted to do long term. And uh, maybe a couple weeks in, uh, I think I called Ken and said, this is, this is good for me. I, I'm going to learn a lot here. Um, and I really enjoy it. However, I, I just know it's not what I want to do long-term. And I said, I, I give myself two or three years and that's about what it was before I finally called him and said, okay, coach, I need, I need to, uh, come to Carson Newman full time. If you could somehow work that out and, Hey, look, n never challenge Ken Sparks because he's going to answer the bell. And he certainly did and came up with a full time job in the athletic department, uh, which I was kind of over. It's probably the job um, that Adam Cavalier has right now, mm -hmm. pretty much generally over sports information and some other things. So uh, and we got some things going uh, back then. So uh, but, you know certainly had to do with with basketball a little bit to do with, with baseball but overseeing sports information for all the sports at Carson Newman uh, working with David Barger obviously the athletic director at the time uh, in in marketing and promotions and all those things uh, which was a whole lot of fun I mean it, it you know it's a, it's a small family there at Carson Newman uh, and so I think we all 
uh, knew each other pretty well and and loved working with one another. And so it was easy for me to promote whatever it was, you know, Vicky Kazee and softball or whatever it was. Uh, we were we were certainly happy to do it. And and uh, the thing I remember about Carson Newman, and I know it continues today, is you know back then it was a as you mentioned at the NAIA level now Division Two, but. I mean, we we operated like we were at the very top of the heap, uh, you know, in in college sports. And I think um, that's the way successful programs operate. That's the way they think about themselves. We didn't have the budget of some schools. We certainly didn't have the manpower of some schools. But that that didn't mean that that we didn't work as hard as as folks at at, at the larger places and at the top, top division. So. Um, and, and I know that that's the way it continues today at Carson Newman. I, I follow you guys closely enough still to this day to know that. So um, uh, that's what we did back in the day, and you guys are still doing it today. So I think Carson Newman was a special place uh, back in the early 80s, mid 80s, up until the early 90s when I left. And uh, without question, it still is today. When you look back at uh, at those days, I think a lot of people now see Berktar Stadium, see the press box, see how nice it is. And then obviously around the country at a lot of the places that you travel to, how beautiful some of these facilities are. Well, what people probably don't remember is maybe back during your time when you traveled, uh, maybe you'd get uh, a little fold out table or something like that. And you mentioned going to Grand Junction, Colorado, and who knows what kind of efforts you had. What was the broadcast setup like for you on most Saturdays? <laughs> well, at Berktar Stadium, it was pretty good, uh, quite honestly. I remember we uh, took over the uh, opponent's coach's box and turned that into the broadcast booth because in the early days, we were just in the main press area. Both the home radio and the visiting radio were just – out there with with the uh, sports writers and everyone else and so you had you know Stan over on one side of that you know blabbing away calling the game and then you had the visiting broadcaster on the other side blabbing away so you had these competing you know voices of of the respective schools going at it uh and in between us were sports writers and all the other media folk who were there covering the game so uh, we we took over eventually um, I said, Coach Sparks, we got we we got to get this taken care of. So we moved into the opponent's coaching box and then built across behind the opponent's bench uh, a, a coach's box that was, you know, b- behind the visitor's bench. And so I think it worked out well for the, uh, the visiting coaches, and it certainly worked out for us. We got our own booth, um, but on the road now, I mean, it it was, man, I, there were so many crazy places we brought Franklin College in Indiana was one that was man you, you had to be almost like a, a Navy SEAL to get into the thing uh, it was challenging at Elon over at Memorial Stadium back in the day uh, but uh, it just but that was part of the charm too um, you know Michael you know it really was I mean we didn't know any better quite honestly most of us um, and so we just we just made do you know we were we were going to call a college football game on the radio. That's the way we looked at it. And, you know, we, we felt privileged and, and honored to do it. And uh, they could have set me up in the end zone, you know, on a blanket. And I, I wouldn't have cared. You know, I was 20-something and having the time of my life. So, um, but, again, when we were at Berktar Stadium, things were great. Uh, some of the places we traveled. Now, most, most of the places in the uh, South Atlantic Conference, uh, the league we were in uh, back in the day, were, were really good. But you get outside of, of conference play and play some non-conference games, it, some of those were, were were very challenging, to say the least. But again, we enjoyed it and it didn't really know a whole lot better. Yeah, I think if you get broadcasters together, you could probably talk for hours about some of your favorite locations of where uh, you're sitting in the bleachers or you're sitting in the stands or you know there's somebody in front of you yelling the whole time. There's a lot of stories that you could get into, so I think that's always a fun thing to revisit. Yeah, basketball locations. Now, some of those broadcast spots were, as you said, in in the stands. Uh, you know, at the end of the bench. I mean, we, you were lucky sometimes to get in the building. Football wasn't just awful, but uh, basketball certainly. Uh, we had some challenging uh, venues, to say the least. 
So you spent 12 years at Carson Newman, um, you know, and as you mentioned, you, you had some other uh, jobs during the time, uh, TV stations, radio stations in Knoxville, those kinds of things. Uh, why was Carson Newman so valuable to your development uh, as a professional during those formative years? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you know, I, I remember the week before I went to the went into the broadcast booth at Carson Newman for the first time, uh, was in the Tennessee broadcast booth when, when a guy by the name of Herschel Walker debuted and, uh, the voice of the balls at the time, the late John Ward, uh, lived in the same neighborhood that I did in, in, uh, in the Farragut community. And I remember asking him and probably asked Bob Kessling, probably didn't uh, ask John directly, but like, Hey, Bob, look, I, I've got to be in the broadcast booth next week for the first time in my life and have no idea what I'm doing. Right. And so I said, can I just hang out in the back of, of the booth there and, and kind of watch you guys and see how you do it when the game's going on, see how you do it when you're getting ready for the game, you know, see how you uh, uh, effectively pull this thing off. And so I was kind of, you know, like a fly on the back of the wall. And it was a big time struggle between Tennessee and Georgia. And uh, Vince Dooley was the coach of the Georgia Bulldogs at the time. And he brings out this freshman in the second half uh, by the name of Herschel Walker. Uh, I don't remember how many yards Herschel had in that second half, but it was a bunch. Uh, and the legend of, of Herschel Walker began, was born, uh, and – my goodness, obviously what, what he ended up doing in, in his career. But that, that was the week before my uh, first experience in the broadcast booth. So um, that's a story I'll, I'll never forget and, and enjoy telling it a lot. But uh, uh, to get the opportunity at such a young age, I was 19 at the time, had not turned 20 yet. Um, uh you know, I, I, I was working at WIVK Radio in Knoxville, which at the time was, uh, I think, I can't remember exactly when was voted the number one country station in the United States, had incredible pros there, uh, both in you know, spinning records, uh, literally spinning records all day long, uh, country music, but we also had a separate news and sports division, which was a little unique uh, for the time, but just the incredible pros that they had there. Um, that I was able to sit and learn from and then to, to start calling games at, at Carson Newman to sit in there with with Bill Powell and Greg Parm, as I mentioned earlier, that first fall just to kind of allow me to get my feet wet. And then basketball season was all mine. I dove in there and, and, and you know, never having called a basketball game in my life, uh, jumped in and started doing it. So I'm, I'm sure that the folks at Carson Newman uh, who were uh, back in the day listening Thanks to them for for letting this kid come in and, and really learn uh, on the job. And we had so much fun. Uh, and Carson Newman had such good teams uh, that it was invaluable to me, Michael, really, uh, over the course of the years to to, to sit there and, uh, you know, be a part of, of a program that I had such respect for. And not just Coach Sparks. As I mentioned earlier, it was – uh, you know, across the board in the athletic department and on the uh, on the uh, college side as well. Um, Dr. Maddox and, and his his folks, he was the president at the time. And um, so, uh, you know, I feel a sense of gratitude still to all those people to this day and uh, remember so fondly my, my time at Carson Newman. And I could have stayed there. I mean, I, uh, I remember when I left to go to Marshall, it wasn't that I had this Oh, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't like it here anymore, or I, I've grown tired of this place, or I, I need to be doing something. It just it w wasn't that a, a, at all. Um, it was just maybe it just felt a little call for a different challenge. I'm not sure exactly what it was. Can't put my finger on it. Um, but it was an emotional time for me to, to make that decision to leave. I mean, I, here I am working with these people whom I respect and love dearly. And, you know, we've talked about my relationship with Coach Sparks. That would mean, you know, cutting loose from him uh, in, in a way. I mean, I, we would always be close and always be uh, more than friends. But um, 
and, and again, I can't really put my finger on why I decided to, 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 to take another uh, job and, and to move on. Um, but uh, again, looking back at that time, wouldn't trade it for anything. Uh, and had I not gotten the Marshall job, that, that would have been fine. I would have stayed at Carson Newman. Might have still been there today. I don't know. And that would have been fine, too. Um, uh, I mean, that, that's, that's East Tennessee. That's where I was born and raised. Those are my roots. I'm very proud of them. Uh, still a proud uh, Tennessee hillbilly and, and, and will be to the day I die. But uh, I just, uh, you know, I, I could probably, if I worked at it, get emotional here just thinking about Carson Newman and, and the folks who were there and who were still there that I, that I know and love there around, in and around Jefferson City. Did you get to build a relationship with John Ward at all? Oh, very much. Uh, John, as I say, lived lived in our neighborhood, and and uh, I was a left-handed golfer, still am. But uh, and his house was off the first fairway on the left side, so my little uh, baby hook, which was really a monster slice <laughs> back in the day, a lot of times would end up in John's backyard, and John would be hiding behind a tree, and and uh, uh, you know he would make comments about me looking for my golf ball in, in his yard. But I was a, a kid at the time. But then as I got older. And especially when I started working at WIBK and uh, covering Tennessee football and basketball, got to know John Ward a whole lot better then. As a matter of fact, when um, I had the opportunity to go to Marshall, I called John. I said, look, John, I, you know, I'm at Carson Newman and uh, love what I'm doing. I'm doing play by play. And uh, but I've, I've got an opportunity to go to Marshall. And and, and we talked through that a lot. And, and you know, John encouraged me to, to, to go to, to make that move. And quite honestly, it was maybe more than anything else uh, was the way John felt about it and just felt that, that, that maybe I needed to go. Um, and I respected him so, and, and uh, you know, re- remained in contact with him uh, over the years. He was just, he was one of those very special individuals, not because he was so good on the year. He's the best I've ever heard. And I don't think it's even close, but uh, just over the course of the years from time to time, little handwritten note would show up in the mail and it would be from John Ward and he would have just words of encouragement and, and things like that. He was just such a special uh, individual and, and so thankful that number one, I grew up listening to him uh, and thankful for that because when I got into the business, I thought, well, wow, I actually kind of learned without knowing it simply from listening to him for years and years and years and years from the best who'd ever done it. Uh, and then to actually know him and have a relationship with him over the years was uh, very, very meaningful and, and special. Final question that I'll ask about your Carson Newman days, and this is more out of curiosity for myself than it is anything. In the 1980 Media Guide, in your bio, it says that you wanted to pursue a career in broadcasting and or acting. Was mm-hmm. acting... The backup plan was it ever really a consideration or was that maybe just the fact that you were 19 and that was kind of a, a yeah, thing that you were that, considering yeah that was probably one of those i, I gotta say something what is it uh <laughs> but but at the same time i mean i i was a big fan of of radio and television and movies still am to this day love watching movies uh and uh you know i for my entire college career, I went to Tennessee with the exception of one semester, which I went to Carson Newman. Um, Ken got me talked into to transferring to Carson Newman, which made a whole lot of sense. Uh, but then when Bob Kessling left WIVK, they offered me the sports director's job there, and it made a lot more sense for my career to go back to Tennessee. And uh, But anyway, I uh, had some... Uh, theater classes at Tennessee, had a theater class at, at Carson Newman. So it was, I was interested somewhat uh, in, in the arts and, and acting, but I don't know if it was ever uh, really a, a serious uh, thought of mine that, that I would ever really be an actor. I thought probably maybe it would be fun, something like that. But uh, because once I got hooked now, uh, in, in sports casting and, and being able to be a part of the game, I was, uh, the the hook was set deeply. I, I, I wasn't going to leave that for sure. 
Yeah, one of my favorite broadcasters, Marty Brenneman, said that he thought about being a thespian as well. That that's the <laughs> career that he thought. So it was it was just an interesting overlap that I was just curious about. Uh, then you go a, to that problem that came from a teenager who didn't have anything better to say. <laughs> Uh, so then you do end up going to Marshall and, and uh, you're there for four seasons. Uh, what do you remember about your time with the Thundering Herd? Oh, my goodness. Just four of the best years of my life. They really were uh, in, in so many ways. And I, I, I can compare it to Carson Newman in that, you know, this was a different level. It was one in the old days you had Division One A, and then you had one double A. And Marshall at the time was a one double A school. Uh, just below 1A there. And, but they treated everything like it was, you know, you're, you're in the SEC or the Big Ten or whatever. Um, and a great athletic director, Lee Moon, uh, who just did things, you know, uh, from the top down. Now, he, he didn't look that – he didn't approach it that we were anything less than the best. And, you know, my first year at Marshall, they won the 1AA National Championship in football. Billy Donovan, after a couple of years, got his career started as a head coach there at Marshall. So <laughs> there were great programs. I mean, Jim Donnan was a football coach, went on to Georgia and had a very solid career with the Bulldogs as the football coach. So, you know, there I am with, uh, you know, Jim Donnan and Billy Donovan and Lee Moon, who went on to be the athletic director at, at Wyoming for a long time, uh, is at North Florida uh, now. But, just great people, great pros, uh, great coaches, great athletes. Uh, missed Randy Moss by one year. Came to Wake Forest uh, the same year that Randy Moss was was coming in. But uh, there were just some great football players, great teams there. Uh, and just what I remember the most, though, about being in Huntington was, I mean, Marshall was uh, king, right? I mean, it was a small college town and. And remember so many times going in places to eat. And once they found out you were the voice of the herd, you weren't paying to eat in my place. You know, uh, it was that kind of deal. Uh, and on game day, I remember coming back from my first game. My wife asked me, well, how was it? And I said, you know what? It was like being at a Tennessee game, oh, just a little bit smaller, you know, not not as large a stadium. But the tailgating and just all the, the pageantry around the game uh was incredible so again I, I can't say enough about my four years in huntington i know you've had steve cotton on uh this very podcast and uh, steve and i were there together just like we were at, at carson newman for a few years and uh it was just a special place it is a special place uh, and when i first got there lived with a family until i got my own place uh that had lost their father in the plane crash of 1970 so I remember that first fall when when uh, Marshall won the national championship. You could just feel all the emotion bubbling up from that uh, tragic past, uh, and it was like, really, we're about to win a national championship, and we lost our entire program in a in a plane crash. Uh, so it was it was an emotional time to be uh, in Huntington. Uh, a movie about that, right? Um, we are Marshall, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a special place, special place in my heart, and I certainly keep up with uh, with Steve and, and the folks in Huntington, uh, and I, I consider myself very, very fortunate to have been there four years. Yeah, I think when people think of Marshall, they think of Randy Moss first, and then probably Matthew McConaughey second for his role in mm, yeah. in in We Are Marshall. I believe the quarterback, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, was Chad Pennington on that national championship team. Would that be accurate? From Knoxville, Tennessee. Yeah, yeah. Chad was a, a terrific. Uh, now, the the national title team of of uh, uh, ninety two. It was not Chad. Chad came after that, um, but uh, Chad came on, and and it was neat because we had the Knoxville uh, connection. He was a web school graduate, and I think his son, as a matter of fact, uh, maybe just committed to uh, to Marshall. I'm not one hundred percent on that, but. Uh, yeah, it was good. Uh, uh, Chad Pennington called his, uh, I believe it was his true freshman year. And then I think Marshall got a, a transfer, Eric Cresser from Florida, a Florida quarterback. And Chad actually, I think, uh, uh, redshirted his sophomore year to allow Cresser to play. And then behind that, it was Pennington Moss. And then uh, Marshall really took off. 
uh, moved into the Mid American Conference Division One, and and uh, you know the, the legend of Moss and Pennington, those guys that went on to play in the NFL started. So. Uh, some unbelievable players came through Huntington, West Virginia, for sure. Well, you didn't get Randy Moss, but you did get Tim Duncan in your first season when you went to the Demon Deacons at at Wake Forest. Uh, when you think about kind of that five year timeline and and the people that you got to spend time with at Carson Newman, then you go to Marshall. You just seen five national championships at Carson Newman. You get a national championship. Uh, at Marshall while you're there and then you get an opportunity obviously you don't know that at the time that Tim Duncan's going to become one of the greatest players of all time but what was it like in your first year uh, covering Wake Forest dealing with somebody that's such a transcendent player albeit very quiet yeah well I mean it it was you know that was uh, my first year here at Wake Forest was Tim's senior year so he was already the dominant player in the game and we all felt I, I say we a lot of my friends and I, uh, as I was coming to Winston-Salem, felt, well, it, Wake Forest is a shoe-in to go to the Final Four. And so I was all excited about basketball. Uh, had some really cool football wins in that in that first year, uh, early in the season. But then uh, some losses started stacking up, and we started looking ahead to basketball. And, and working with Dave Odom, the coach, whom I talked with just the other day on the phone, um, but, but Tim Duncan was, was a real treat. Now, Tim was, uh, in that first year with me, his last year at Wake, much like he was throughout his career in the NBA with the Spurs, kind of a quietly stated player, didn't use his mouth a whole lot, but just absolutely beat you to death with his skill, uh, his determination, uh, once he got into the NBA, his professionalism, uh, but he was such a good player. Uh, and, and, you know, I was no basketball expert for sure. Uh, but when I got here to Winston-Salem, you could just tell you were in the presence of a great, great basketball player. And we all knew that, that Tim was just going to be a, uh, you know, a can't miss kind of NBA player. Now, I, I don't think maybe we knew, maybe some did. I don't claim to, to at the time, uh, being one of those who said this is going to be probably – one of the best forwards to ever play the game, which I, I don't think there's any argument that that he is. Um, uh, but he was he was awfully good. Uh, and, you know, Wake Forest lost a second round game uh, in the NCAA tournament that year. And so didn't get to the final four uh, and, and we're all very disappointed. But, um, you know, Tim Duncan is uh, everything that, that he's made out to be in terms of just uh, such a good person, great, great basketball player. Don't see him around these parts all that often. He, he was there this past year, uh, came back and uh, was honored with a lot of his teammates and Coach Odom uh, at one of the basketball games. It's always great to see him sporting a new hairdo these days, but <laughs> has done so much uh, uh, for his his native country and, and for underprivileged folks uh, around the world. So he's just a great human being and uh, it was a it was a, a fun way for sure to get uh, my weight days kind of jump started. Uh, let's fast forward to uh, present day. Uh, you are fortunate enough that football is going on right now for Wake Forest. Mm-hmm. What has it been like broadcasting during COVID times? Yeah, it's been really weird. I mean, you you we've learned to kind of take it week by week. Uh, earlier, a game with Notre Dame had to be postponed to the end of the season. Thankfully, it wasn't canceled; just postponed. But it's, uh, uh, Michael, it's really been strange. I, uh, as deep into the summer as maybe a couple weeks before the opener, uh, that first weekend of September, none of us was really quite sure that we were actually going to play. Uh, and I'm still not convinced, and we're, what, a month in, uh, that we'll play from week to week. I mean, it's just, it's just that kind of a, kind of take stock in where you are and with whom you're playing, because if the other, you know, if your opponent has a handful of positive uh, cases, you're probably not going to play the game. So it's it's been kind of surreal. Um, I've always prided myself on going to practice a lot uh, and having a lot of interaction with coaches and players, and there's been none of that. I have not been to one practice. Uh, have not seen Coach Dave Clawson, our head coach, face to face since the spring. Have not seen a player face to face since the spring. 
Um, we, we do all of our interviews, including the, our, our pregame interview with the coach on Zoom calls, <laughs> like you and I are doing right now. Um, and it's just, it's just like you're doing it from 30,000 feet. And it, and it feels, I feel so detached, which is not the feeling that I want, nor is it the feeling I've had in, in 41 years. It just hasn't been this way, but it is this way. And so we all have adapted. Um, we will do a couple of games this coming fall, uh, road games that we actually stay here in Winston-Salem and call them off television monitors. Uh, we've luckily had a little practice in that at the end of last year, Wake Forest played uh, in the pinstripe bowl. We were at Yankee Stadium and our broadcast position was literally, you were talking about wacky broadcast positions earlier and you wouldn't figure at Yankee Stadium, you'd have maybe the worst one you'd ever had. But just because you're in a, a baseball park, uh, the way it was configured, we were directly behind the goalpost. Uh, and your, your depth perception was completely destroyed. And so after just a few plays, it became evident, no way could we call the game accurately. And so I told my color analyst, Larry Sorensen, Larry, you look at the field, right? You, you look at things as they are happening. I'm going to call the game off the television monitor over here because <laughs> it's the only way I can I can do it. And so we've had a little bit of practice, and we'll, we'll call a couple of games that way from our home stadium, even though the Deeks will be uh, at Syracuse and at Louisville. So, I mean, that's squirrely, right? Uh, but that's just the way it is. That's 2020, and so we adapt. We're thankful to have games to call regardless of where we call them from. And I'm sure basketball season will be greatly affected as well. Uh, and, and hopefully we can get 2020 and then the basketball season of 2021 in our rear view mirror in a hurry and get uh, back to some kind of normalcy, whatever, uh, whatever that is. Absolutely. Let me hit you with a couple uh, broadcast uh, centric questions. Uh, four decades in the industry. And as you mentioned, you start when you're uh, in essence a teenager still. How has your preparation, how has your broadcasting adapted during that time? Wow. Well, you know, some of the, uh, you know, advancements in technology are incredible uh, now. You know, we, we do all of our broadcasts over the Internet now. Uh, and most, most schools in the ACC do that. And so it's evolved over the years from, I remember, uh, doing a, a more than one or two, a few Carson Newman games over the, the old telephone because uh, we, we just couldn't get the phone interfaced w with the gear properly. And so we, we had to do them on, on, on the telephone. And, and you know, back in the day, really, th that's what a broadcast was. It was just a kind of a, of a fancy phone call, but not anymore. Um, so the technology is certainly... Uh, advanced how we prepare. I remember when the fax machine came along when I was uh, at Carson Newman, we thought that was the greatest invention ever. You know, we could get uh, information on the opponent without having to wait on on the U.S. Postal Service, right? Um, so, uh, you know, just being able to get, you know, information instantaneously now from a lot of different sources. It, uh, now you have to filter through so much information just to pull out what you're going to use for a broadcast. I mean, just mountains and mountains and mountains of, of things you can go through. Um, when back in the day, you were lucky sometimes to get a roster, you know, that, that was, that was updated. Um, I remember when I used to make my broadcast charts, uh, we, I don't even know if it's still around East Tennessee printing up in Rogersville, Tennessee. Uh, they did almost all the printing work that, that we needed at Carson Newman and, and I kind of sketched out uh, uh, kind of a chart that I wanted to use, and, and they printed those out. And, and the charts I use today still very similar to the old days uh, back in the early 80s. Uh, we just use InDesign now, though, and, and, and make them up on our, on our laptop. So, you know, you know, the biggest thing just in preparation is uh, – uh, you know, the technology. And, th and that goes back. I remember, you know, we used to get uh, interviews with, with Coach Sparks and, and others on, on tape and take them to a radio station there in Jefferson City and actually edit tape, you know, splice tape together. Uh, so we've gone from that to uh, almost all the recording I do now is on an app on my phone. Uh, 
uh, and we even do post game a lot now uh, on our phones and email the they sound like they're they're live they're actually not I'll interview the uh, a player or a coach after a game just on my phone and email it uh, to the studio and then they play it as if it were live so uh, just a lot of different ways that we cut corners and do things quickly and and they all sound fantastic they sound much better probably than we do now over zoom but it's weird now you know here in 2020 you know even at, at the national networks the what you accept now as being normal uh, technologically isn't as good as what we left in 2019. Hopefully we'll be back to it in, in 2021. But again, just different ways that, that, that we adapt and, uh, you know, uh, get things done here in, in the year of the pandemic. If you could pinpoint one game, which I know this is hard because I struggle with it myself, uh, that you've broadcast, that you've been able to be a part of in that regard? Is there one game that really sticks out to you that you think of, wow, that was an unbelievably great game that I had a chance to sit there and, and be a part of for a couple hours? In my 41 years? Yeah. Wow. Honestly, for, for sentimental reasons, uh, one of them has to be that 83 national championship game at Mesa. We, I remember being so excited. We all got national championship rings. Uh, and there was a place uh, between Strawberry Plains and Jefferson City, uh, probably still there today. There was a farm. They had a, a big barn. I think they had horses. Uh, and we were all in there, had a big meal and a big ring presentation. I remember, the, and I wasn't even a player, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I remember the, my heart just beating out of my chest because I was going to have a national championship ring, which I still have uh, today, uh, along with all those others we got at Carson Newman. But uh, without question, that that was so meaningful. Uh, I was probably I turned I turned 23 uh, by the time that 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 Carson Newman won that championship, and you know for some of the reasons we've already talked about, that was such a special. Uh, a special football season and, and, and a special time in all of our lives back then. Um, without question, having been in Huntington for a very short time and to win a national championship, when you understand what it meant to that community because of the plane crash, uh, that, that horrible tragedy, uh, and knowing so many people in that community who lost a father, a son, a brother, a neighbor, um, but to be a part of that in, in, in a small way uh, was was certainly very meaningful and and was even though just a few weeks into my time at Marshall was probably the crowning moment of my time there and just in terms of, of, of things I remember uh, and uh, at Wake Forest uh, you know back in 2006 uh, Wake Forest won the ACC championship in football. And think of the teams now that are in the ACC. Uh, Wake Forest uh, won the ACC title, went to the Orange Bowl. Uh, And I remember uh, before that football game started, uh, Arnold Palmer was out on the field uh, representing Wake Forest, and Muhammad Ali was out representing uh, the Louisville Cardinals. You know, two of sports' biggest icons are out there, and uh, there were – conservative estimates that there were about 45,000 Wake Forest fans there. Now, Wake doesn't have that many alums, uh, but there that that team uh, just really captured uh, everybody's heart. Uh, Jim Grobe was the head football coach at the time, uh, uh, won the national, the Bobby Dodd National Coach of the Year Award uh, that year. North Carolina, North Carolina State, Duke, none of those teams has won an ACC title since Wake has in football, not basketball, football. So that was a special year. And I, I could pick out a lot of games uh, uh, in, in basketball here, but th- that football game in 2006 when Wake won the ACC title uh, against Georgia Tech when neither team scored a touchdown, <laughs> it was a field goal. Uh, battle. And then, you know, Wake lost that Orange Bowl game, but just being there at the Orange Bowl, it was a very competitive game right up until until the last few minutes with Louisville, a really good team at the time. Uh, I'll never forget that. And, uh, you know, the, the that first NCAA tournament with, with Tim Duncan and crew here, 
I remember uh, Skip Prosser's first season. We went to North Carolina and, and beat the Tar Heels in triple overtime at, at the Smith Center. Uh, uh, a freshman by the name of Chris Paul w- was on that team uh, along with others. So uh, that's a game that, that to me, will, will, will stick out. But uh, uh, so many uh, over the last 25 years uh, here at Wake Forest in basketball that I could pick. But uh, anytime you beat the Tar Heels, that's good. And when you have a couple of characters like uh, Skip Prosser, the late Skip Prosser, uh, and Chris Paul, who's certainly still a, a huge part of the uh, sports landscape in our country, that, that's a good thing. I think that's a, a good stopping point, a fun trip down memory lane. You've been extremely generous with your time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. It's been, been, a, been a great treat. It's always good to be on the banks of Mossy Creek. And uh, love and uh, respect all you folks back in Jefferson City. Well, that's Stan Cotton. He was our guest here in Episode 5 of Mossy Creek Conversations. Please subscribe and leave a review for other Eagle fans to find more Mossy Creek Conversations. Thanks again. Until next time.